But you have me at a loss. You know my name, but who are you? Just another American who saw too many movies as a child. Another orphan of a bankrupt culture who thinks he's John Wayne, Rambo, Marshall Dillon. I was always kind of partial to Roy Rogers, actually. I really like those sequined shirts. Do you really think you have a chance against us, Mr. Cowboy? yippee ki motherfucker. <laughs> Welcome back to the Whiskey Flick Party, pals. I am your host, Terrence Dunn. Very excited to be back in the saddle with all of you again as we wrap up our look on Die Hard and more this week. Um, I am very excited to dive back into the world of John McClane and Die Hard, of course, with my co-host, Mr. Matt Graham. Matt, how you feeling? It's Thursday. What's cooking? It is Thirsty Thursday, and um, I think there's a crock pot in the kitchen that's cooking my dinner for this evening. Yay, crockpot food. Uh, I'm good, man. I'm good. All right. Well, as we said, we're going to dive into our wrap up on Die Hard, which we, of course, kicked off last week. Before we do, we can't have a whiskey flick party without, of course, the flick, but also the whiskey. So let's talk a little bit about what's on tap for today. Uh, Matt, what is going on in your neck of the woods? I am drinking Jameson again. I got a nice little glass here of Jameson. It's keeping me keeping me level. Nice. Um, well, I am personally sampling uh, Heaven Hill Bottled in Bond, seven-year age Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. This was actually recommended uh, by a listener of the show, Dave in Northern California. So shout out, Dave. It is awesome. Uh, definitely loving this whiskey. So, so thanks for the recommendation. Appreciate that. Keep those recommendations coming. Always love to try new stuff. Previously on Whiskey Flick, so if you listen to our last episode, Matt and I dove into all of our thoughts on Die Hard. We talked a little bit about the action movie Hall of Fame cast and crew that populated the film, as well as the history involved with the film, including the book that it was based on and more. Uh, we talked a little bit about our favorite one-liners. I know you got a chance to hear from both Matt and me on that, as well as our favorite action set pieces of the film, including, of course, the thrilling conclusion from the 30th floor of Nakatomi Plaza. We also spent some time debating a little bit about whether or not Die Hard qualifies as a Christmas movie. And of course, we spent some time talking about what Die Hard would look like if it wasn't, right? And Christmas was pulled from it. Now, after we published that episode, you all had a lot of thoughts about Die Hard that you wanted to share with us on social media and through our Whiskey Flick hotline. We wanted to dive into some of that and talk a little bit about that. So uh, Matt, one of the things that we threw out there on Twitter was we did throw out a couple of different polls, right? And we'll kind of talk about a few of these. One of the ones we had to talk about was favorite one-liner. Um, this was something that we discussed live on the show. We landed on your favor being welcome to the party, pal, but it looks like uh, the listeners out on Twitter actually voted for what's probably the more classic, which is the yippee Kaye motherfucker uh, took it just by a hair, 44%. Um, any thoughts on the, the fan favorite one-liner, man? Yeah, they're probably right. I... I am too often in my life contrarian. I don't know. Um, I'm not a hipster. That's not the proper term for me. But like definitely hipster tendencies when it comes to uh, some of the choices I make in my entertainment. So, yeah, uh, I, they're probably right. And uh, I still like my welcome to the party, pal. I am still a fan, and it's the one that I continuously keep revisiting uh, even since the show aired. Now, one of the other great polls we wanted to get some insight on is we did spend a decent chunk of time at the top of the episode talking about the Die Hard sequels, because we're probably never going to talk about them again. Um, and we wanted the chance to talk about Die Hard as a franchise. And so we asked all of you, what Die Hard sequel was your favorite? And it was overwhelming. 63% of you agreed with Matt and I, which was Die Hard with a Vengeance, the third film in the series. That classic with Samuel L. Jackson uh, was definitely definitely the big winner here. Live Free or Die Hard came up next with 25%. And I did think it was important for us to note that not a single person voted for uh, A Good Day to Die Hard, which kind of reflected what we mentioned about it on the show. Matt, any thoughts? 25% uh, shockingly high for Live Free or Die Hard, but <laughs> do you? Um, I guess it's not. I don't know. It's, it, 
Sure. If that's your cup of tea, then drink it up. But um, <laughs> I'm glad that the vast majority of our audience sided with us and they were right in doing so. And now, of course, the most important poll, because this was the one that seemed to get people the most riled up, right? Because we not only had people respond to the poll, um, but we had people send us voicemail messages about this one to the hotline. And that was whether or not Die Hard's a Christmas movie, right? We dove into the controversy on the show. And on Twitter, the Twitter folks were overwhelmingly on our side. 73% of the people who responded to our survey said, yes, they agree that Die Hard is a Christmas movie. We talked about it endlessly on the show. Now, of course, we did have some folks out there that had strong enough opinions that they sent them our way via the whiskey flick hotline so matt we're going to check out a couple of their voicemails and give us a chance to kind of react to their thoughts from the listeners so this first message comes to us from eric in california let's take a listen die hard is no more of a christmas movie than the thing is just because there's snow it is not a christmas movie matt any thoughts um that might be the most poorly put together argument i've ever heard it's an interesting one because they actually did show the thing at Christmas time at some theaters here in Southern California. First of all, uh, I mean, he's from California. I, I don't know how many Christmases I associate with snow. Very few. Very few Christmases I've experienced had snow. Maybe cold weather, but very few snow. And I know, I don't know, half the world's population that lives below the equator that has zero snow around Christmas. So to think that snow is more synonymous with Christmas or as synonymous with Christmas as literally the date Christmas Eve, I don't know about that one, but that's okay. Thank you for listening and thank you for calling in. But I do think that The Thing is a fun winter movie. So it is one I do watch at wintertime because it is very, I mean, it's Antarctica though. So like technically I could have been in the summer. Thing's a great movie. Love the movie Thing. Definitely not mad about bringing up thing. We can maybe think about doing a thing on a thing podcast later at some point in time. But uh, yeah, I don't know that that one uh, holds that holds about as much water as a holy boat. All right. So this next message comes to us from Lizzie in Texas. Let's take a listen. I don't really think this is a hot take on Die Hard, but it's absolutely a Christmas movie. I don't understand why this is a debate. One of my favorite Christmas books that I actually read to my son this year is the Die Hard Christmas book, which you should totally look up. It's amazing. And it's written in the story of, or it's written like A Night Before Christmas with the rhymes. And one of my favorite, like, pages in it is, uh, and now I have a machine gun. Ho, ho, ho. And it's totally a Christmas movie. Anyway, that's my not hot take. Matt, any thoughts on that? I, I love that Christmas book, by the way. That's actually it's one so of my good. favorites. It's so good. So it's not a hot take, but it is a correct take, Lizzie. So thank you for calling in and agreeing with the correct <laughs> the correctness of what we're bringing to the table. And that is, yes, it is a Christmas movie. Uh, well, wrapping up Christmas, right? Because we definitely want to put the Christmas conversation in the rearview mirror. We did put one more poll out there, and that was about people's favorite controversial Christmas movies. Uh, we threw out their Die Hard. We threw out their Gremlins. We threw out their Black Christmas. And then we we left the last one open and said, if you've got a different suggestion, let us know. And 75% of people voted for Gremlins, which you and I did agree uh, in our post conversation was, in fact, a Christmas movie. Matt, any thoughts on Gremlins taking the spot over uh, Die Hard and, and any of the others? Confused? Bewildered? Especially after a Die Hard episode? <laughs> but okay with it? Uh, shout out Gremlins, I guess. I uh, I didn't watch it a whole lot around Christmas time as a youth, but uh, yeah, I mean, I've seen it a few times around. It's a Christmas movie. I'm not mad at it because I do watch Gremlins at Christmas time every year. So uh, different strokes for different folks. Maybe we'll bring Gremlins out around Christmas time. Uh, that would be a fun one. Uh, so we did have a couple other comments that came from some folks. We had Sam in California who uh, commented on one of our Instagram posts to point out that this was actually in our, our announcement that the cat was out of the bag about us covering Die Hard, um, that she actually actually has a cat named Hans Gruber, which obviously is named after the villain in the film. I thought that was pretty cool. It kind of makes me think about like what I might name my future pets. Uh, Matt, any thought on cat version of Hans Gruber? Pretty awesome. Hopefully you're not dropping that cat off a roof like every day or like once a week. Hopefully there's no <laughs> dropping of Hans Gruber the cat off a roof um, or at a window. Hopefully Hans Gruber is safe and sound and that the only similarity that he has with the character Hans Gruber is the name Hans Gruber and that he's not treated like Hans Gruber. So, but uh, yeah, that's an awesome cat name. We had one more voicemail. This voicemail came to us from Ian in California who had thoughts on firearms use in Die Hard. Let's take a listen. I just wanted to say that as a gun guy myself, there are some great guns in that, in that movie 
uh, like the Beretta 92, the Steyr Aug, the MP5. There's an M16 in there as well. Very great uh, gun selection. But I just noticed that everyone in that movie uh, holds them like they've never held a gun before. And I think we have a new standard with movies now about gun handling since the you know, John Wick movies and those kinds of things, uh, setting more realistic standards. Uh, but it makes me laugh every time I watch that movie how, uh, how they hold the gun. All right, Matt, any thoughts on uh, the take on the gunplay in the film? He's correct. I mean, we kind of nodded to it, alluded to it a little bit where there's like bullets not going through one table and through the other side of the table in one of the scenes. And then, yeah, just a general... I mean, that's that 80s, 90s action movie vibe, though. I mean, up until... It was only, you know, obviously more recently and then a handful of movies in the late 90s and 2000s where, like, you could tell the people making the movie knew what they were doing from a gun standpoint. It is, it is absolutely just like, here, hold this as if it was a prop. It's more of the gun's a prop, not a gun in most of these movies. So, yeah, I agree with his take on it. Yep. And shout out John Wick. We're going to need to do a John Wick movie at some point here because those John Wick movies are insane. They're really cool. You and I talked about, not on the show, but you and I talked about John Wick the other day when we were talking about the movie Nobody with Bob Odenkirk because obviously a lot of uh, a lot of similarities there. Also a very, very good movie. Um, last but not least, we had to uh, comment on some feedback we got from Brittany in Ohio. She was particularly unhappy with a certain part of the episode and she commented on Twitter, giving us a one-star review based only on the questionable opinions regarding Tim Burton, Nightmare Before Christmas, and the quote, very obvious shot at me about Fallout Boy, dead to me. Uh, Matt, I actually was an advocate for Tim Burton, so I'll let you take the Tim Burton piece. Thank you for reviewing. We're sorry that it was a one-star review, but thank you so much for reviewing the podcast. We encourage everyone to rate and review the podcast. Uh, preferably give us five stars unless you're um, a part of the Tim Burton fan club, and in which case I understand the one-star treatment. Um, however, I will ask you, Brittany, to maybe amend your stars to not just punish Terrence. Don't punish Terrence for my you know, my choices. This is a two-man show. Maybe give us 2.5 stars um, for the Tim Burton hate, because that Tim Burton hate's only coming from one of us, and that's me. I dislike Tim Burton's movies. The Batman <laughs> movies were okay. He's a talented director. I'm not saying he's bad at his job. I just don't like the movies he makes. Just not my thing. That's not my thing. Maybe I'm a simpleton who's not artistic. It is what it is. Uh, yeah, how about uh, moving over to you, taking shots for Fall Out Boy? How dare you? They're a great band, sir. What is wrong with you? Yeah, and I will say this. I definitely threw a little bit of shade at Nightmare Before Christmas and Fall Out Boy. I say that as a fan of both of them. I enjoyed I enjoy both the film. I just saw Fall Out Boy this past summer. I've seen Fall Out Boy live a number of times. I think I I, I, I fired a shot at Panic at the Disco a little bit too. I, I have no uh, I, I have no no cover for my actions. I definitely I definitely said it uh, in jest. Again, as a fan myself i just know that there's so much overlap with those fan bases it was too juicy of a target not to miss so Brittany, just know that it was said with love welcome to our first ever whiskey flick fan fight all about Die Hard. In last week's episode, you got to hear opinions from Matt and myself, but we wanted to go to the experts for this first ever fan fight. So first up, in the red corner, we do have the host of the 58 West King Fantasy Football Podcast, Mr. Tony Cosentino. Tony, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing well. Thank you for allowing me to come on with you guys. Uh, people who know me, you know, they know two things. They know I have phenomenal hair, and they know I love to argue. You brought me on to argue. You brought me on to see my hair. Thank you, Terrence. Happy to be here. We did, and we're very, very excited to have you. You are here as a diehard uh, Christmas movie truther, so we're very excited to have you on to argue that key point. To introduce our opponent in this fight in the blue corner, we do have the host of the Taco Court Fantasy Football Podcast, Mr. Nate Money. Nate, how's it going this evening? It's going well, Terrence. You know, for everybody that knows Tony, they enjoy his hair. But everybody that knows Tony enjoys my hair more, so I am glad to be here so that the people could enjoy my hair. They also know that Tony is really good at arguing, but the only person that's better at arguing to get to a solution, which is my side, is me. Therefore, I'm glad you brought me on 
to lift this show up and create some controversy. That's what we're all about. Absolutely. Well, we are happy to have you here. Nate, you are uh, you are the heel in this matchup, so to speak, because you are representing, and, and I, I guess I should caveat this, because anybody who's listened to the Taco Court Fantasy Football Podcast during the holiday season knows you are a die hard holiday fan. Like you are big on the holidays. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Some people would say I was born in a manger. Some people don't believe it. Those people would be Tony, who's on the other side of this argument. And once again, he is wrong. Therefore, yes, I do love the holidays and especially Christmas. It is my jam. Well, we have you here because you don't believe that Die Hard is, in fact, a Christmas movie. And so we're going to give you guys a chance to argue that point. So here are the rules of the Whiskey Flick fan fight. So each team is going to get an opportunity to argue their side for about three minutes. Uninterrupted, they'll get a chance to make their case either for or against Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Their opponent will then get an opportunity for up to a minute to argue the counterpoint and try to pick apart uh, the other person's argument. And then at the end of the day, we're going to see if uh, you've convinced each other. I guess we'll find out later if you've convinced the audience. Tony, you won the coin flip, so you are going to be coming up first. Are you ready to make your case? I am. Fantastic. Then three minutes on the clock. All right. So I do believe this is a Christmas movie for a multitude of reasons, but a few are that it takes place during Christmas. We all know that. There's tons of Christmas music. If you go back and watch it, you hear that. Presents. There's a couple presents exchanged in, throughout the movie, beginning and end. Santa makes an appearance in the movie early on. I'll go over that here in a second. It's snowing at the end. Hasn't snowed in LA and I don't know how long. Uh, John's wife has a Christmas name. Her name is Holly. Less than a minute into the movie, we see John getting off his plane holding a giant teddy bear, a Christmas present for Holly. The stewardess over the intercom wishes everybody a Merry Christmas. The three-minute mark, Mr. Takagi wishes guests at the plaza a Merry Christmas. This is Nakatomi Plaza where they are celebrating Christmas at a Christmas party. The three-minute, 20-second mark, Holly tells Harry it's Christmas. She brings up Rudolph, Chestnuts, Frosty, and then they also talk about Scrooge. So obviously a lot of Christmas theme there. The four minute mark, Christmas decorations litter the sets everywhere. So the director was clearly setting a picture, setting a tone, painting a picture, sorry, that it is Christmas. Wait, there's more. The seven minute mark, John is in a limo with Argyle. Do you guys know what song they're playing? Christmas in Hollis by Run DMC. Uh, 11 minute mark, we're back in Nakatomi Plaza and there's a Christmas tree in the lobby. There's Jolly Spirit, all of that going on. The 13 minute mark, a moving Santa is in Holly's office. We walk by that, the camera kind of looks at it for a while. So there's Santa that I mentioned earlier. The 20 minute mark, Christmas tree is in the main lobby of Nakatomi Plaza as Hans Gruber sets up shop. All the villains start coming in, but they you know, walk by that a few times. It's lit up, it's beautiful. The 23 minute, 38 second mark, there's boobs. Uh, I watched this a few times. I went back and made sure that they were human boobs, female boobs, and they were. So you can take my word for it. Doesn't have anything to do with Christmas. I just wanted to bring that up. Uh, fast forward to the two hour and three minute mark. There are trees outside the plaza after, you know, there's been some explosions. They're decorated. It's lit up. It's beautiful. Uh, you get a warm embrace from John and Holly, the McLeans. It's snowing. And then the movie ends with Let It Snow by Vaughn Monroe. The final thing that I will say is that director John McTiernan was interviewed and asked about whether or not Die Hard was a Christmas movie. And he said this, quote, we didn't intend for it to be a Christmas movie. So he's admitting it is there. But the joy that came from it is what turned it into a, Christi a Christmas movie. End quote. In conclusion, Terrence, this pro Christmas movie argument sells itself. I'm just here doing my duty as a red blooded, freedom loving, patriotic American citizen. I rest my case. Nate, before I give you a chance to react to Tony's argument, you, man, you brought some some serious notes to this one. Uh, you had timestamps. So Nate, you get an opportunity here. You get up to one minute to try to tear Tony's argument apart before you get to make your case. So Nate, the floor is yours. For anybody that's listening right here, every time you watch a Christmas movie, right, you expect the movie to be about Christmas. Now, Tony knocked off a bunch of timestamps in the movie, which is all fine and dandy for the person who created the movie to set the scene during Christmas time in December. However, Tony failed to state that, and he, he sort of did it when he said at the two hour and seven something mark, right? This movie is a little bit around two hours and 14 minutes long. Tony sat there and told us about timestamps within the first seven minutes of the movie that just say, hey, it is around this time of the year right which is why they're in a plaza at the same time and everybody's together it's because it's a corporate christmas party then he went on to say hey it's snowing outside at the two hour and seven mark or whatever like that there's two hours and seven other minutes within this movie that have absolutely nothing to do with christmas nor did tony even talk about anything with the plot of the movie or whether or not it is revolving around christmas 
All right, Nate, that's a solid rebuttal. But now we want a chance to actually hear you really unpack and make your case. So uh, just as we did for Tony, the floor is yours to, to go in and let us know your take on why Die Hard is not, in fact, a Christmas movie. Look, there's three things that it takes to become a Christmas movie, right? And Die Hard has a couple of them, but it's missing one. Number one is the Christmas aesthetics, which Tony did talk about a lot, right? Yeah, it takes place during Christmas. There's little trinkets here around. There's some music. Yeah, because it's around that time of year. It has nothing to do with it. If it was a summer movie, you'd sit there and hear country music while they're barbecuing in the same fashion, right? They could easily put this movie to be 4th of July. Number two, do we watch it at Christmas time, right? Is it a Christmas tradition to sit down and watch it at Christmas time? And and with that, does it feel weird or is it unacceptable socially to watch it any other time of the year? If I sit there and say that I'm watching the movie Elf during March or June or July or August, people think that I'm weird. No, you could watch Die Hard. It's just an action movie about some guy who's trying to save his marriage because his old lady is too involved in her corporate life and he wants her to be the stereotypical American mom because this movie was made in the 80s, right? So he does his thing. He puts on a wife beater and he goes out and jacks up a bunch of Germans. The movie is about a hot situation Germans and this guy's trying he's the only guy who didn't get captured and he's trying to win back his wife by doing such right therefore I feel fine watching that movie at any time and some people have sat there and decided that they want to watch it during the Christmas time because it has that piece into it which we'll get to here in a bit number three does the movie pertain to the spirit of Christmas and what Christmas is really about about togetherness about family about love about hope about magic about believing in things right there is this is where Die Hard falls off the cliff and has nothing to do with Christmas it has none of this whatsoever. When you look at the movie, yes, it does take place in Christmas. There is one thing from Christmas that actually falls into it is he writes a note saying, ho, 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 I got a gun, right? Like Santa came to help him out and fight off these bad dudes. Would you say that Batman Returns is a Christmas movie? It takes place during the same time frame. Not a single person thinks that Batman Returns is a movie for Christmas. And if it were a Christmas movie, would we have to be sitting here arguing the fact of, is it a Christmas movie? Everybody can accept all the other Christmas movies. They are Christmas movies. All the Hallmark movies, all the children's movies, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Those are Christmas movies. You don't have to argue it. You have to sit here and have somebody argue the point that it isn't a Christmas movie because there are people who are emotionally unavailable that during the Christmas time when it's time to sit down with their family and their loved ones for a couple hours to show that they love them. They have a hard time doing it. Therefore, their way of doing it is saying, hey, this is a Christmas movie. Let's watch action. Let's watch this big, strong man, all sweaty, fight off this whole, you know, German entourage that's taken over this entire building that just happens to take place within a Christmas movie. The most important point. So I apologize. I'm going to add one more. Christmas movies are released during the Christmas time frame in the winter, right? I, I would dare anybody to double check this, but Die Hard was released during the summer. If the box office felt like it was a Christmas movie, they would have waited till the end of the year. I'm done. Sorry. Apologize. I'm taking more time on the stand than I can, but that's what makes a good lawyer. Nate, you, you've made a very persuasive case here, but uh, as we did uh, for Tony's argument and for you, Tony, I want to give you the opportunity to respond. So I've got a few things. The first, if you make a good Christmas movie, you can release it at any time of the year you want. You can compete with the, you know, the Marvel movies, the superhero movies taking place in the summer. You can release them in December, compete with the other Christmas movies, or you can release it, you know, January, February, where no movies are coming out, really. Uh, the second thing is the timestamp and like the material I went through. We're only allowed three minutes. Like I could only go through so much material. I wanted to get what I got in there. I also wanted to get the boob timestamp in there. I think that's important for your listeners, Terrence. So again, that was the 23 minute, 38 second mark. You're welcome. The third thing, you didn't make many good points, Nate, but you did make one. And that point was about missing ingredients. Does Die Hard have every single ingredient that you listed to make a good Christmas movie in your opinion? It does not. But when I think about like a pizza, my my kind of pizza that I make, I got pepperonis, jalapenos. You know, there's obviously mozzarella cheese. There's there's sauce. There's dough. You know, I got the cheese on top of the, the, the toppings just to make sure you get it all nice and crispy there. If it's missing jalapenos or pepperonis or pepperonis and jalapenos, at the end of the day, it's still a pizza. And at the end of the day, Die Hard is still a Christmas movie. A very, very compelling case from both of our fan fighters. Before we wrap up here, I, I do want to give you each an opportunity to weigh in now that you've had the chance to kind of hear the other's perspective. Um, so let's see, we started this whole thing with Tony. So Nate, I'm going to start with you. You've heard Tony's case, how he feels it's a Christmas movie. Do you leave this persuaded or are you sticking to your beliefs? The moment you have to relate whether something is a Christmas movie and the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to a pizza, you've lost the argument that it's a Christmas movie. Therefore, I stand 
exactly where I stand on my two feet, cement around the feet. You're not moving me one bit. That is my my stance. All right, Nate is unmoved. So Tony, you came in with a, with a pretty strong desire to, to argue that uh, Die Hard is in fact a Christmas movie. Do you leave persuaded by Nate's argument? I did have that list of rebuttals, but you know, it's very important uh, for us as a society, really just as a people, like the human race, to have the ability to take in new information, to take in new information and have like an informed and maybe a changed opinion, right? Like we, we see that with science and health vaccines right now. That's all over. That's been all over the place for the last two years. But in the case of Die Hard, I think I believe even more now that it's a Christmas movie. Doubling down, doubling down based on that one. Uh, gentlemen, I want to thank you both for taking part in our very first ever fan fight all about Die Hard. We want to actually hear from the listeners to, to get their take on this fan fight. So we're going to throw a poll up on Twitter at Whiskey Flick Pod, uh, and you get a chance to weigh in. Who do you think won the argument? Was it Tony Cosentino from the 58 West King podcast? Was it Nate Molinek from the Top of Court Fantasy Football podcast? So hit up Whiskey Flick Pod on Twitter, place your vote, and let us know. We will uh, crown the champion. All right, Matt, as we wrap up Die Hard, any final thoughts either on uh, the conversation between Nate and Tony or any other additional commentary you wanted to share to close the book on John McClane's story? Tony's right. Nate's wrong. Pretty simple. Um, I'm glad they took the time out to reaffirm my thoughts on both of them and their point of views on Die Hard. So that's cool. Yeah, John McClane, Yakitomi Plaza, classic movie. We're going to do a lot of classic movies on this podcast. So thank you, everyone, for joining in, jumping in, and uh, watching them, going to the movies with us. Absolutely. Um, I'll just add uh, some commentary on that, that I think the one piece that no one's really successfully addressed, right, that I don't think Nate really answered in his response, nothing about uh, my commentary about the redemption arc, right, and the fact that redemption was a theme, which makes it a Christmas movie. Movie. haven't really gotten any good answers to that so if you have any thoughts on that on twitter by all means uh you know shoot them our way we'd love to hear if you don't think that the redemption theme is applicable or if you if you agree that that helps support it as a uh, as a christmas movie so to close up the show we do have a couple of kind of quick review segments that we wanted to do as we always do here on the show the first thing we wanted to do is a little bit of news and notes right kind of some hot takes and updates that have come in throughout the course of the week first one that i wanted to talk about matt was very relevant given the fact that we brought up the matrix movie in my rant on last week's show uh and that is village roadshow the company that produced the new Matrix film is suing Warner Brothers over its simultaneous day and date release uh, on HBO Max uh, as they believe it harmed the box office take for the film. Matt, any thoughts on uh, Village Roadshow and Warner Brothers fighting each other over the very subpar Matrix movie? It is par for the course. So when you when we re when we had recorded the Die Hard episode and you gave me you know your your takes on the Matrix movies, the new Matrix movie, I had yet to attempt to watch it. I say attempt because I have since attempted twice to watch it and stopped and realized the error of my waves. It's bad. doesn't matter where it was played. You both should sue each other for putting out a shit film. So way to go, Village Roadshow and Warner Brothers. Outside of money, it's viewership. You want people to view the things that you make and uh, going to HBO Max increased your odds. Look, it shows because it doesn't show. You don't get, tw oh, look, this guy only watched the movie for 10 minutes. You get a play. You get a stream. So it, it shows that I watched the movie. I ensure you both groups that I did not watch the whole movie because it was bad. But yeah, I, I streamed it so it counts as a view. So good for you. The the second major news story that came out this week related to films, obviously, was the announcement of Oscar and Razzie nominations. We're not going to do a deep dive because there are far smarter podcasts that you can go listen to for that. Um, but just at a high level, Power of the Dog was a huge one. Most nominations with 12. Dune came in next with 10. One of the coolest call outs, I think, that stood out to me as I was looking over the uh, the Oscar nominations was Jane Campion. I hope I didn't butcher her name. Uh, nominated as Best Director for Power of the Dog. It's the first time in history that a woman has been nominated twice for Best Director. And she's actually a favorite to win. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, lots of love for Dune, which I've seen. A, good, a lot of love for Licorice Pizza, which I've also seen. Wasn't really familiar with a lot of the Razzie nomination films. Uh, they really hated on this Netflix movie, Diana the Musical, uh, as well as uh, Space Jam, the most recent Space Jam. Matt, any kind of like big picture, high level thoughts on this year's Oscars and Razzies? I feel like Nightmare Alley got a few noms. Um uh, gear. So, and I have not seen the movie, but like from everything that I've seen, it it, it visually looks like the most appealing movie made this year. Uh, so we'll see. I, I now that I have all the nominations, and I got to go watch all of them before Oscars in a month. So let me work on doing that. Just get right on that because I got nothing else to do. <laughs> but yeah. So I, I, shout out to Power of the Dog. I, I have it's a good movie. I want to watch that so bad. I've not. It's watched really it yet. good. It's um. It's just crazy the world we live in where a straight to Netflix movie is leading the way. And I mean, we kind of see this coming, but it's just, it speaks to like 
the transition that movies have made large in part due to streaming services being so powerful and then obviously COVID having a huge piece of that but I mean yeah I, so it, you know it was crazy what a few years ago when um, The Irishman was nominated but The Irishman had a run in theaters first before it went to Netflix and then it wasn't nominated for that many things for, correct me if I'm wrong Power of the Dog is Netflix day one and it is leading the way in nominations it's favored to win most of them so yeah this is just another benchmark in that transition from big theater cinema to streaming cinema and I don't know that I'm super Super happy about that. I have thoughts on pros and cons for both, but yeah, it'll be uh, it's kind of wild. Kind of wild. Well, I'm, I'm sure we're not done talking about the Oscars and the Razzies. In fact, I know I've talked a little bit about uh, with you about potentially uh, you, me, and uh, some of our degenerate gambling friends joining us for a little bit of a wager around the Oscars. So we'll see if that comes to fruition. Uh, stay tuned for more. So to wrap everything up, as always, we want to have the opportunity to uh, talk about what we're listening to and what we're watching this week. So first of all, the soundtrack. So Matt, anything you're listening to this week? Um, I started kind of creeping more into Spotify. Um, I'm an Apple Music guy, but I have Spotify on my computer, so I'll listen to some of that stuff. And uh, chill hip-hop playlists. Really nice mix of some current stuff, some older stuff, some good mood vibe music, some J. Cole, some Baez, some Mac Miller, some good stuff, some Kit Cudi. So, yeah, take a listen if you're not already listening to that on Spotify. Me and my bitch Took a little trip Down to the garden Took a little dip, oh no. Apple juice falling from my lips. Took a little sip, on bitches coming, go. You know that? Money coming, go. You know that? Love coming, go. Don't shit last. Bitches coming, go. You know that? Money coming, go. You know that? Love coming, go. Don't shit last. Take a seat, baby girl, you've been all on my mind. I know I ain't called, got a part of my grind. Just cop the Maroon 5, no Adam Levine. Came a man by myself, only father was time. I like it. Um, I'll give a shout out to what I've been listening to this week, which is uh, the Thrice album, The Illusion of Safety, which just recently celebrated its Get Ready to Feel Old 20th anniversary. So I've been giving that a ton of spins this week. I'm still hoping they'll do like a 20th anniversary show, though I'm not holding my breath. They don't really play a lot of that stuff live anymore. Um, but it was a great reminder that So Strange, I Remember You and Trust are like two of the best heavy songs ever. Um, so shout out The Illusion of Safety. Shout out to Thrice. Close up shop with a bit of a rent free rant. And I know, Matt, I want to rant a little bit about stuff that I've been watching this week, but anything that's on your mind? The same, actually. So I spent, I don't know, better part of the last two years being a contrarian to Ted Lasso. Um, you see it everywhere. It's Apple TV. And like I've tried to watch other Apple TV programs before and was not even a little bit impressed. So I kind of was putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. I just kept hearing good things about it. And I was like, you know what? Fine. I, you know, I have Apple TV. Let me just throw it on. And I threw Ted Lasso on and almost done with both seasons in less than three days. It is a great show. It was a fun show. It was a feel good show. It's got a nice mix of like cheesy, feel good comedy with like a little bit of heavier overarching themes, some mental health stuff in sports specifically, and uh, just really good contrast between the main character who's like this modest, very nice, overly polite Midwesterner who's coaching a soccer team in England and gets called a fucking wanker and a yank. And it's just really good. It's a really good show. Highly recommend Ted Lasso. That's awesome. Well, I'll, uh, I'll I'll follow your lead and recommend a show that I've been watching. And I've, I've talked about it on Twitter a couple of times before, but I've been obsessed with the HBO Max show Peacemaker, obviously based off of the Suicide Squad film that came out over the summer. Um, I've really, really been enjoying the show. It's really funny. I love the action. I'm a huge James Gunn fan. Like anything that dude has done all the way back to Sliver and Super, like sign me up. And so the show is really, really fun. The opening credit sequence is one of my favorite opening credit sequences of any television show ever. Just this choreographed hair metal dance sequence. 
events is just a lot of fun. Um, so if you haven't checked out Peacemaker, it's almost done. The last episode I think airs in mid February, but it's airing weekly. So you, you still have time to, uh, to jump on board. Well, thanks again for joining us for whiskey flick as always hit that subscribe button. If you like what you hear and feel free to throw us a review. Uh, it'll always help other people find the show. Uh, we'll be back in your feed next Friday as we hop into the DeLorean for our next film. That's right. We are going back to the future. Um, as always, we want to hear from you. So you can hit us up on social media at whiskey flick pod to join polls, share your takes. Uh, you can email us at whiskey flick pod at gmail.com or call that whiskey flick hotline. And we'll feature your voicemail on the show. The phone number is 818-660-6369 for your chance to be featured. Matt, any final thoughts or anything you'd like to plug before we wrap up shop at whiskey flick? Yeah, if you're uh, listening to us, you like my voice, you like Terrence's voice, you also like football, fantasy, or otherwise related, go listen to two other podcasts out there. One of them that I co-host and another one that our buddy hosts that features me and Terrence on quite a bit. Uh, those shows are at the 58 West King Fantasy Football Podcast and the Taco Corp Fantasy Football Podcast. Both everywhere you're listening to this, they're available there. So go check this out. Once again, 58 West King Fantasy Football and Taco Corp Fantasy Football. So yeah, come listen to us talk about sports and NFL. Uh, definitely give Tony, Nate, and Matt some love over there 58 West King Taco Corp the links to both of their shows can be found in our show notes Tony the other day it's funny you mentioned voices Tony the other day on Twitter uh, described our voices as seductive and you know he's not wrong he's not wrong he's also been known to have a very low bar for what turns him on I've seen Tony get turned on by the announcer at Home Depot like the guy who goes on the overcome so, so I mean shout out to us but also shout out to Tony for being so easily turned on we're, we're learning a lot today there's a lot to unpack uh, you can follow the show Whiskey Flick Pod on all socials you can follow me at Terrence Dunn 13 or you can follow Matt at Graham the Man 69 on Twitter. As always, thanks again for checking out Whiskey Flick. We will see you next week as we go back to the future. Until then, keep the whiskey flowing and the flicks going. Reagan, the actor? <laughs> He's like, I love he's like, I love it when you dock brown me.